So uh, in terms of the internal dialogue, I think, uh, well, it has been discussed here a lot, the, uh, the question of uh, uh, the kind of uh, 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 meanings that they would be producing, uh, not to, to, to quote and, and, and borrow Lin's idea, of not, not to <coughs> multiply singularities, but try uh, 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 relations of translation, and I'm just here stealing everything from you, maybe, <laughs> right? Uh, as a metaphor, uh, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I just want to say that you have that dimension, but I'm interested in, uh, uh, um, uh, in the other, uh, uh, which is uh, how your uh, uh, the writing that you produced as a group, how that uh, uh, creates a dialogue with the outside communities. So in that sense, uh, uh, and, and my, my uh, it's not a question, but anyway, uh, 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 for me for me today, uh, working with collaborative uh, uh, um, projects. Uh, I think it is important to find a way that the product of that work somehow uh, 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 encompasses the uh, s uh, dimension of difference that is within the collaborative process. And I'm talking about uh, here a language specifically. So uh, if, for example, the product of your writing uh, uh, is something that uh, uh, is just a genre, uh, that would uh, 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 reproduce stable fixed forms, uh, 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 unitary meanings, uh, conventions. Uh, somehow that would be a negation of the internal process that was undertaken in, 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 uh, for the collaboration. So uh, it's not really a question, but I, I'm, I'm just uh, wondering if you have that concern in what you write would somehow be also uh, in its materiality an experience that would mean or would resonate uh, 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 meanings of collaboration within uh, the product itself. Right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's I don't have to answer that, but it's just, it's just my answer. <laughs> no, that's that's a great point. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, I completely agree that that is a, a valid concern associated with the project. And it was interesting for me hearing uh, Mandalay your talk. I think there was some some interesting connections, not only with using technology to explore different relationships, but also you talked about cross-functional affiliation, which I think is another way of phrasing the sort of things that um, we're interested in exploring. And I think part of that cross-functional affiliation has to encompass uh, audience and you raised some really valid points about how the actual product of the experience of collaboration will be received by the audience and um, I don't honestly have a, a proper answer for that because we're still in very early phases but we're looking forward to seeing how it is received because um, it sort of it, it came out of a collective um, dissatisfaction with some things in our department and things on our own campus that we thought there was um, an audience for the types of questions that we were interested in but not really a formal forum to pose them um, so we sort of formed around the idea that people are interested in these ideas and they do want to talk about them and so we do know some people <laughs> that we think are going to be interested in the final product but yeah I will definitely report back to you when we actually get some engagement because we have some um, trying to plan some talks at our own university and other places to sort of share this idea in this process. So. Looking forward. Yeah, thank you. I think I use this time to answer Jamil's question uh, about cultural competence. <coughs> I really, I, uh, I don't like this uh, uh, term uh, myself. Um, there is this uh, competence is um, a field of research in applied linguistics in Brazil, which I think very find very conservative. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think we, we need to oppose it to performance, but I will <laughs> again because uh, I think what Jenkins means is, is exactly that. If you don't know uh, how to, to use a certain cultural item, then you're not able to do it. But then uh, uh, when I'm, um, I talk about performance, I think it's uh, related to Penny Cook's idea of uh, trans transcultural flows in the way how people refashion uh, these uh, items in their, uh, according to their local needs. Uh, and I think that, that part is more important than thinking about cultural competence itself. Well, then I can address one of the issues in a minute. First, I'd like to say that I was talking to Brian about his comments uh, 
I think uh, the, to talk about uh, identity politics in in our case of applied linguistics, it's important to remember that we went through this phase and it, it helped us constitute our, our identity. Um, Jamili mentioned, uh, you raised the point of um, the term that I'd use, uh, Hanseat's term of distribution of sensible and, and intersemiosis or multisemiosis. Or, um, I think uh, it's related in the, in the sense of uh, what we call the visual, I was using the visual in that sense because I was speaking, I was using a term that was that's part of our cultural context because that really, it, it, that's part of the problem. I didn't want to go for lack of time into analyzing those texts, but that is one of the problems. Because we tend to, <coughs> when we're talking about literacy, indigenous literacies, there's this idea that these are oral cultures. And that's one example of how you know, the, the distribution of capacities and sensibilities uh, Western distribution of capacities and sensibilities is to divide the world into the oral and the literate. Right? Uh, when the oral is not the oral, the oral is simply the not literate. That's that's what we basically mean, right? The graphocentrism, if you like. Um, and then uh, we could say, oh, but these are visual cultures. And then what happens to orality in these visual cultures? So that's what the distribution of sensi sensibilities is. How we you know, the, the, how we separate these different uh, uh, knowledges and uses and uh, what Rancière says, uh, distribution of sensibilities, how, we, how, we, uh, how each community separa divides or distributes its what is sayable, what is not sayable, who can say what, where, when and how. Right? Uh, and all our epistemologies are, are, are examples of this or when we, when we try to make the separations between ontologies and epistemologies as well. So, uh, is it an ontological difference or is it an epistemological difference? I would say that uh, ontologies are the product of epistemologies and not the opposite. Right? Uh, we have to know what what, what exists is is is, uh, is is a product of what we know rather than the opposite. But that's we've inherited this from the Greeks that it comes first we have being and then we have knowledge. Um, so th this is part of uh, what I was talking about. We, we tend to accept these distributions and terminologies uh, as if they are they're truthful and static and universal. And then when we come across cultures which are very different to ours, we impose, we attribute the same categories to these other cultures. Yeah. Can I ask a very quick question following on that? On that? Do you think that synesthesia is uh, a term that could be applied transculturally, or do you think it is just the way our Greek tradition? How how do you how do, what, what do you mean by synesthesia? Because different people use it in different ways. Of sensibility in five senses, and then, and sort of uh, dividing them that way, whereas. It could be perhaps divided in other ways. Yeah, I, I, I use the synesthesia in that sense, but uh, it's culture. How we understand synesthesia is cultural as well. Some, uh, as you know, in indigenous cultures, the spiritual world is part of the natural world, right? And the perceptions of the spiritual world are, are normal perceptions, or the division between what is visible and not visible is a different division to what we have. Uh, so that's, for me, that is also part of synesthesia. Uh, when we make, when they make visible what is invisible to us, uh, and therefore non-existent, uh, so their sensi sensibilities are divided in different ways, they acquire different meanings, and that's part of semiosis. Thank you, Lynn. You're improving your views on synesthesia, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's always been my view on <laughs> well, maybe I'd like to take just a few seconds then to also answer some of my response. And again, I'll go quickly because you know of my long paragraph. <laughs> um, okay, so very quickly, I, I mean, I'll, I'll talk to Brian's question when he asked me, when you were curious about uh, what you said, this kind of simultaneous cosmopolitan and nationalist um, um, discourse within the youth. <laughs> Uh, and how I kind of read that. So 
I mean, again, I might be mistaken or reading it through my own biases, but what I see in this kind of embrasure of like cosmopolitan, in this kind of cosmopolitan embrasure of the idea of difference right now in Quebec and among the youth, what I see it's a very self-validating form of cosmopolitanism. I mean, that's really how I perceive it. But beyond that, what's still really crucial to the point I'm trying to make is that within this discourse, there's still and the absence of a conscience of our own coloniality as settlers. And if we want to have any forms of sovereign project that is predicated on a real decolonization, we first need to be able to at least engage with our own coloniality. And it's not even remotely part of like popular political discourse right now in Quebec. So I think that's the first stage is to be able to acknowledge our coloniality as settlers. And very briefly too, in terms of what you said was these like my courage in um, uh, addressing these challenges to the nationhood and self within an hostile classroom environment that might not be sympathetic to these concepts. Well, the thing you need to remember too is as I, when I was teaching this text a few weeks ago actually, I was teaching it in an English-Canadian uh, classroom. So that's a very different challenge because, and it brings very different challenges because in this case, what I need to be really careful with is to avoid like validating some form of Quebec, Quebec bashing, you know, or like because I'm Quebecois then becoming this kind of native informant validating English Canadian students Quebec bashing. So this is kind of like a very difficult line I have to walk and really walk on eggs and find a way to make conversation about this very productive within this kind of both British French settler quality of like Canada. So I think that was really the most important challenge and not the fact of like putting students in a position where they, they're not gonna like what I say about them or something like that. Bruno, was it, was it you or was it Brian? Who made the comment about the, the Haitian music and the generation? It was you. It was Brian. It was, it was, so, um, uh, just, just to pick up on that for a second there, how do you, how do you, how do you read what, what a, well, I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on your question, but it's the same question. So how do you, how do you read the, uh, the next generation's or, uh, um, response to Haitian music in French, in Quebec? Um, is it, is it, is it, how are they, how, how, how is it pure laine Quebecois respond, engage with, distance himself, herself from that? Because it's, it's a rhetorical question for me, I admit, mm -hmm. but yeah. well, I mean, uh, again, in this kind of like, and like the young, like, you know, like pure land Quebecois interaction with these ideas of like differences, again, I see something that is very self validating in the way it is being consumed or portrayed and appreciated and I mean sometimes I just say it you know just to sound a bit polemical you know just to like create reaction but you know sometimes you know I feel that there's nothing that the Quebecois Pulin likes more than to see a negre who uh, will like eat poutine like sometimes throw a little case French Canadian slur and talk about hockey like that makes them just so happy you know because there's something about there's the other who validate my existence and who I am you know so then the interaction, consumption with this otherness and this, this form of cosmopolitanism I see as often the self-validating. That's what I meant by that. Thank you. And what I appreciated about the papers was the different forms of cosmopolitanism that were being talked about in Vanderlei's paper and then in your paper, um, that, that Penny Cook's notion of how things travel from one location to another and get transformed in the process. That was in your paper, Bruno, as well as in Vanderlei's paper. Uh, it was in Riley's paper as well, and, and perhaps even in yours, Lynn Mario, uh, in another way. Um, I think one of the phrases I really liked in Riley's paper was um, the attempt to create a culture of intellectual possibility. Uh, I wrote that down because it really struck me as another way of thinking about culture beyond tying it to identity, uh, but rather tying it to agency, possibility, potential, the way we're thinking about it here, and the kind of intellectual culture that we're trying to create uh, through our own collaborations. If I could comment on that. Um, yeah. I agree. I think it's an excellent idea. 
And in a way, I see all these papers as um, reflecting on the possibility of uh, semiotic possibility and increasing semiotic resources across what seem to be uh, borders. But the borders, if they are worked on, and if there is time and goodwill and the potential for empathy, then what seems to happen is um, a, an intersemiotic humanity can actually take place. Occasionally, it can even be textualized. And to paraphrase what the uh, translation and transcultural group at Glendon are interested in, is the textualization of these um, intersemiotic uh, contacts. And by textualization, any form of semiosis is fine. So increasing semiotic, semi, not, not just semiotic space, but increasing semiosis across boundaries seems to be what I take away from all of your papers. You know, just as long as we also translate the concept of the human, because which in for indigenous Brazilian cultures doesn't make sense. Um, so the, the human, there's no separation between the human and, and other forms of life, including the invisible and the spiritual, whatever. Right, but Brazil hasn't gone as far as Bolivia or Ecuador in inscribing Mother Earth, Pachamama, into the country's constitution. So I would include in semiosis the ground of semiosis. And the ground of semiosis is the relationship between humanity and, uh, and uh, our ecology that permits semiosis. Because without the uh, ecological ground, there can be no anthroposemiosis. And there is, of course, biosemiosis and zoosemiosis, of course. And we're talking really about anthroposemiosis in a context of zoosemiosis. That's a lot of Greek, but maybe um, <laughs> maybe that's also a good transition, a good transition into indigenous challenges and opportunities in Canada and Brazil. Uh, I think that follows on quite nicely.